At the time of the attack, most of the weapons were still packed away and the colonists could only access a few pistols and swords. They were planting corn in newly cleared fields when 200 warriors descended upon them. The fort wasn't completed and most of the settlers ran for cover behind one bulwark. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. All five council members attempted to fight back, but were repelled with every single one sustaining injuries, except for Wingfield, though an arrow had passed through his beard. They fought for an hour, and one boy was killed, and 16 laborers were wounded. They would have all been killed if the sailors hadn't shot off one of the ship's cannons. When the projectile hit a tree near some of the attackers, it caused them to retreat, and Wingfield ordered the fort to be palisaded. Wingfield's bravery in this situation bought him quite a bit of loyalty from the settlers. Fort building became the first priority, and as such it became the primary source of conflict. Wingfield rejected Archer's town plan, and Kendall chose the single worst shape for a fort. So it was the usual bickering, until one day a young man came crawling back into the fort with six arrows sticking in his body, saying arm, arm, as he collapsed. He died eight days later, and the rate of Indian attacks began to increase. Soon, another person was killed and morale plummeted. As morale dropped, infighting increased. Archer accused Wingfield of setting up a kingdom, and Wingfield accused Archer of setting up a parliament. Now, this didn't mean that it was an authoritarian versus a democrat. A parliament wasn't a means to democracy. It was Archer's only viable path to power, enabling the colony as a whole to vote for Archer to replace Wingfield if he could erode confidence in him. He was accusing Archer of using whatever means possible to get the power he coveted while stirring up discontent in the colony. The sailors petitioned to have Smith put back on the council and it worked. Wingfield was even forced to pay him compensation. Neither Wingfield nor Newport attended Hunt's Calvinist sermons and others accused them of atheism. Fortunately, the kind consort returned before fighting got too out of hand. With two unarmed envoys, he told them that the attack was staged by enemy tribes and that the Powhatan people, including the Pamunkey, were still their friends. They could relax, finish the fort enough to slow a full-scale attack, and feel confident enough for Newport to leave. When Newport left, he took back a sample of ore that he hoped was gold, or at least copper. He took some sassafras, which was valuable as a syphilis remedy, and he took plenty of reports brimming with optimism. They had to be optimistic to encourage investors, but they'd also seen far more good than bad in Virginia, and they still had every reason to be optimistic despite a couple of expected setbacks. Newport also took back a private report, which was sent directly to Cecil from William Brewster, his spy, describing what was actually going on in the colony. That has never been found because Cecil tore off the secret part of that letter. The ore was nothing valuable, and Newport sailors illegally sold the sassafras for their own profit, effectively stealing it from the Virginia Company and depriving both settlers and investors of profits that could be used to mount a supply mission. Essentially, the colony was running months behind schedule and attracting increased Spanish scrutiny while providing no value to investors. Things weren't going better in Virginia. Because they'd arrived to Virginia late, they had only 12 weeks to become self-sufficient. By August, they were down to 500 calories a day, and only three of the chickens that they'd brought from England survived. Their food included a cup of wheat and a cup of barley per day, boiled in water, and meanwhile, they had the choice between filthy swamp water, and if you've ever been to Jamestown, you know that it smells bad, salty river water at full tide, and slimy river water at low tide. Disease began to sweep through the camp, killing about a person per day. The settlers were lost, they were stranded, and they were scared. It's actually a good time to begin to address an accusation which has been very common in discussion of the Jamestown settlers and their troubles, both at the time and to this day. The Jamestown settlers have 
frequently been accused of being lazy opportunists who came looking for gold and brought their problems on themselves when they refused to work. They were upper-class dandies who thought themselves too good for menial labor and that they were due a life of ease and that the middle class and Indians had to try unsuccessfully to pick up their slack. The accusation was leveled at multiple groups of settlers pretty much any time the colony suffered or struggled. These people had no real experience making a life in the wilderness. They were destitute, they were inexperienced, and while about half were considered gentlemen, most were fairly poor. One, for example, was a former Sussex MP who had lost everything in a legal dispute with a local aristocrat and was trying to get some money to support his wife and 11 children and prevent them from becoming homeless. None of the settlers had crossed the Atlantic and put themselves in the predicament in which they now found themselves because life at home had been so easy. They had done it because life at home had been very, very hard. The colonists were about half gentlemen, but the majority were poor. Of the other half, 12 were skilled laborers, but the rest were unskilled workmen, recruited either as servants by the gentlemen or from the squalor of London. They weren't going because of how much they had to gain, Roanoke had shown otherwise, but they were going because of how little they had to lose. Most of the gentlemen had military backgrounds, and they had actually lived in pretty rough conditions on the battlefields of the Low Countries, but this was different. Only the thinnest of lines separated survival from death, and every little problem was a big one. Being held up for six weeks off the coast of England now meant that they couldn't plant crops in time to harvest them, even if they had the skills necessary to do so. The weather was suffocatingly hot. The long voyage also meant that they'd used more of their provisions than they had expected, and they didn't have any left. People in London questioned why they didn't simply hunt and fish and scavenge to make up for the deficit. But even the Indians who had lived off the land for centuries hadn't been able to make an abundance of the land there. A third of their diet came from hunting, fishing, and scavenging, and the rest came from corn. The English were people with no experience living on a swampy wasteland. Their survival was not assured. Even John Smith, who saw himself as the only person who could really make the colony work, dismissed the idea that these people were lazy. Nonetheless, soon, enough people were ill that they didn't even have enough healthy people to man the fort's defenses. No one knew when Newport might return, and by late August, Bartholomew Gosnold had died. Gosnold had remained the strongest leader they had, and he was the one man who really rose above the factions and infighting while commanding the confidence and respect to help minimize it. He was the person that people looked to to keep them out of their miseries. It would be interesting to see how Jamestown history would have been different if he lived, but he didn't. He was interred with full military honors. And at a similar time, Cecil's spy Brewster and Martin's son also died. That Sussex MP I mentioned also joined them. And by the end of September, over half of the colonists were dead. Without Gosnold to steady the colony, and rapidly losing the hope of survival, paranoia skyrocketed. Soon, the colonists started to suspect active sabotage, promoted by sectarianism. They turned to Kendall, who had been one of the two people mysteriously put on the council. Had he been a spy for the Spanish in the Low Countries? He denied the claims, saying he wasn't a Spanish spy, but that he was a spy for Cecil, and that others on the council were too. He had answers to the most pressing accusations, so attention turned to Wingfield. Why had Wingfield been refusing to attend Hunt's services? No, no, no. More important, why had he lost less weight than the rest of them? Ratcliffe, Smith, and Martin accused Wingfield of hoarding supplies, and Martin was particularly adamant, saying that Wingfield had defrauded his son of the rations that he needed to survive. They said that Wingfield's accusation of Smith's mutiny en route was malicious and that he'd been giving preferential treatment to members of the council. Wingfield, in turn, accused Jehu Robinson of plotting to escape with the shallop and go to Newfoundland, 
but this wasn't enough to deflect attention from himself, and he was removed from the council. Ratcliffe took his place as president and immediately arrested him for a list of crimes against the colony, which Archer had carefully tabulated. Suddenly, Ratcliffe found himself at the center of scrutiny. Which Ratcliffe was he? Was he the one who had acted as a Catholic spy in the Low Countries, or was he the one who had been imprisoned with Guy Fox following the gunpowder plot? Or was he the one who was in Cecil's inner circle? How had he gotten such a prominent position in the company? Kendall helped divert attention to, from himself by increasing scrutiny of Ratcliffe, and soon Smith, Percy, and a few others had started to agitate for Ratcliffe's removal. Percy had remained a supporter of Wingfield following his bravery in the battle against the Indians, but it says something that Smith was plotting to restore the presidency of the man who had almost had him shot on Nevis. A blacksmith named James Reed had regular access to the pinnace to help maintain it, and he acted as their messenger, asking Wingfield if he would take the presidency if offered. Ratcliffe discovered the plot, though, and he beat Reed for his participation. Reed threatened to hit back, saying that skilled laborers deserved more respect than that. Ratcliffe immediately tried him for mutiny and sentenced him to death to be hanged from a makeshift gallows. He fought back as hard as he could as they pushed him up the ladder, and he finally begged for a private word with the president. Ratcliffe agreed, and Reed told him about Kendall's involvement in the plot. So Ratcliffe freed Reed and ordered Kendall to be arrested and confined to the pinnace with Wingfield. With each accusation, paranoia intensified instead of diminishing. But here's the weird thing. The accusations were all startlingly true. In a way, that makes sense because they'd been 104 people with no one but each other for company, confined to ships and then a small fort together alone for months. At the same time, though, these are some pretty grandiose claims to even have their roots in the truth. Smith took the position of Cape Merchant, which was the person who managed the company's resources. He felt this put him in charge of relations with the Indians. At any rate, he felt that Ratcliffe and Martin weren't fit to run the colony, they weren't industrious enough, and they weren't good at making the tough calls. The other people were too overcome with sickness and despair to work for their own relief, and they had slipped into a depressed idleness. Virtually no one knew the language, and only a handful were healthy enough to go with him, so he took a few people and he headed to Kikitan to trade for food. But this time he met a very different reception from before. The people laughed at him, and they offered him a small handful of corn and some bread in exchange for swords, muskets, and apparel. This is the point when Smith took his role in the colony and really came into his own. Up until this point, he had been a peripheral character, very involved in the faction fighting, but not particularly noteworthy. In response to the Kikitan offers, Smith piloted his best boat to the shore and ordered his men to fire their muskets. When the Kikitan retreated, Smith followed, and they approached him with the doll of one of their gods, Okias. Smith and his men shot some of the people carrying the doll, and when it fell out of their hands, his men took it. Soon a priest came to ask for their Oki, offering peace, to which Smith responded that if he would load their boat with corn, Smith would not only return the Oki, but also be friends and give them beads and copper. They agreed, and Smith triumphantly returned to Jamestown, stopping by a few other villages to trade in a similar manner for corn. This was very much against the rules of the Virginia Company's charter. Smith was not supposed to initiate any hostility with the local peoples. This is the kind of behavior that made Smith both a legend and a controversial figure. On the one hand, he was the man who succeeded in getting the colonists food. On the other hand, he did so in a blatantly illegal way. On the one hand, he showed determination and ingenuity. On the other hand, he was clearly in Percy's words, a vainglorious fellow to the point that we can't be fully sure about the accuracy of some of his stories. Regardless, Smith returned to Jamestown with enough food to feed the company for four to five days. Only two weeks of food were left in the store from England, though, so this was only a temporary fix, and no one knew when Newport would return. 
Ratcliffe suggested that Smith's next voyage be taking the pinnace back to England to secure a supply, and this prompted a violent argument. Smith brought up the fact that Ratcliffe wanted the colonists to turn back for England as soon as they reached the Chesapeake Bay, and accused him of wanting to remove the colonists' one means of escape from Spanish attack. Smith accused Ratcliffe of being the saboteur, and Smith won the argument. Ratcliffe agreed that Smith should take the pinnace and the shallop to the falls to get more food. So Smith went from village to village, trading often in a similarly heavy-handed manner. He made a point of always taking less food than was eventually offered, though, so that the Indians wouldn't think that he was too desperate for food. He kept his focus on the future, never outright stealing, and never doing anything to put the English in a weaker position in future negotiations. On the way, he passed an uninhabited village with plenty of corn, but he refused to steal from there because he wasn't there to spoil or loot. He wasn't behaving legally, but he wasn't behaving irrationally either. Soon, he was able to bring a couple months' worth of food back to Jamestown. As Smith approached Jamestown, he noticed the pinnace marooned on a sandbank near the fort. Kendall had hijacked the ship and was preparing to take it to Spain, where he would tell the Spanish about the English plans. Kendall had beached the craft, though, and was convicted of mutiny. In a desperate attempt to avoid being shot, he revealed Ratcliffe's real name, which was John Sycamore. Only a former Cecil agent would know this, but it wasn't enough to stop him from being shot. And you remember how I said that a lot of the accusations among the settlers had their basis in truth? Well, Sycamore was a very unique name at the time, and the only known John Sycamore at the time was a Catholic priest operating under the alias of John Ward. As part of Cecil's investigation into the gunpowder plot, Sycamore was found conducting secret masses in houses across Northumberland, which is the home of the Percy family, including at a house owned by a family named Ratcliffe. Sycamore then became a Cecil informer and was thought to have escaped to the continent. Of course, no one at the time had the resources to understand the full importance of Ratcliffe's real name, and the only real issue was how to circumvent the pseudonymity issue on legal documents. Archer was Ratcliffe's right-hand man, and he was a lawyer, so that wasn't actually an issue. Ratcliffe's powers were simply funneled through John Martin, and he remained in control. At this point, Wingfield wouldn't even take power when he was asked. He just wanted to get out. He tried to steal the pinnace to sail to England and tell the London company about the disarray, but Smith stopped him by threatening to sink the pinnace with musket and cannon fire. Smith didn't particularly want to stay at the fort either, so he took 19 companions, including two Indian guides, to go exploring. He didn't need to get food because the colonists still had some of his corn, and birds migrating south for their winter had temporarily alleviated their food concerns. A couple days after Smith took his group of Englishmen to go explore in the shallop, a shivering and hungry Englishman ran back to the fort in fear of his life, but it wasn't anyone from Smith's company. It was William White, the leader of the renegades, who had jumped ship when they first reached the shores of the Chesapeake. Now, to sum up, White's adventures, when he and his companions had left, they'd found themselves in a small village named Chopok. Chobuk was a town that was very happy to engage in trade with the English because it helped them get goods that they could offer to Wahun Seneca as tribute when they couldn't find enough deer for both food and tribute. So the renegades had ended up in a village that was happy to have them, but a village that couldn't really afford to take care of additional people. They tried, though, and the renegades also tried to contribute and to assimilate into their society. They lived peacefully, though humbly, together. For the other settlers, the defection had been damaging enough for morale that future colonists instituted a death penalty for any Englishman who went to live with the Indians without permission. When life was hard, people could wonder whether it was easier with the Indians. They could question English technological superiority, and they could question the point of their struggles if 
There was possibly an escape just a few hundred feet away. What if life was easier with the Indians? And what if they could just escape to the woods and be free of all of the hunger, the disease, and the faction fighting? If they could, then what was the point of living like this and trying to make this work? It was damaging enough that Percy made a point of referring to White as a made man, a person of low social standing who had unexpectedly come into a fortune. He was so inferior, according to Percy, that he wasn't even worth talking about, and they didn't talk about the renegades. The renegades weren't even officially recognized until 1612 when that death penalty was introduced. But... White hadn't stayed with the Indians because one day Obi Ganganu had brought a badly injured man who White recognized as George Casson into the hut that he was staying in. Obi Ganganu then tied Casson up close enough that the fire burned his back while his front was still freezing, and he used White as an interpreter as he interrogated Casson about who his companions were, who his leader was and who had been raiding villages up and down the Chickahominy River. What his leader, his leader being John Smith, what his leader's intentions were, and where he could find John Smith. Casson had been enticed to the shore by some women after Smith had left him in charge of the shallop, and he answered the questions. As obi questioned him, He used sinew and reeds to detach his limbs one at a time, throwing them into the fire. And finally, he cut the skin from his head, disemboweled him, and threw the rest of his remains into the fire to burn. Then he let White go, presumably to tell the people at Jamestown what he'd just seen. Now, this wasn't a standard way of killing in Powhatan culture, and in fact, there are only two known instances in which this type of killing occurred. We don't exactly know why Casson got such treatment, but it's not really hard to make an educated guess. When the Jamestown settlers heard this news, they went to look for the explorers, and they found the bodies of Emery and Robinson, but no sign of Smith. Smith, Robinson, and... Emery and their guide had explored a local creek by canoe. One day, while they were making lunch, Smith went off to check out the nearby lands. He took one of the guides and instructed the others to stay alert and keep their guns ready to fire. After a few minutes, he heard a shout and immediately put his gun to the head of his guide and asked what was going on. The guide simply responded, Flee. Before he could obey, an arrow hit him in the thigh. He kept the guide as a shield and shot back three or four times, trying to back toward the river. Out from the trees emerged 200 Pamunkey warriors, all armed, all aimed at him. Smith lowered his weapon, and they lowered theirs, but when he asked to be able to return to his boat, they told him that all his companions were already dead and demanded his surrender. True to his reputation, Smith initially refused and he kept trying to back toward the river, but he fell through a bog and he knew he had no choice. The Indians were aware that Smith's seeming helplessness may be a trap, so they waited until he was nearly dead of cold and then pulled him out. They then took him to a campfire to let him get warm, even rubbing his limbs to help restore feeling to them. As Smith was warming up, he saw the arrow-ridden bodies of Emery and Robinson lying where he left them. Then he was taken to Opie Conganu. Smith's philosophy when dealing with the Indians was pretty straightforward, and oddly similar to Wahoon Seneca's approach to dealing with the English. Be as tough as necessary, but not tougher. Be as kind as possible when you have the opportunity. And above all, never ever show weakness. So the days of Smith's captivity were fairly pleasant. They treated him well, and he did his best to impress them. He gave Opie Conganu his compass, and he told them about the fact that the earth was round, that it revolved around the sun, and that there were many different peoples and complexions on the planet. He also talked one-on-one to Opie Kanganu as the two enjoyed feasts so extravagant that Smith wondered if they were fattening him up to eat him. It's in these conversations that Smith got his first evidence of the Roanoke settlers. When a man entered Smith's hut to try to kill him to avenge a son that Smith had mortally wounded, the guards protected Smith, who offered to examine the son. 
In his conversations with Opie Kanganu, Smith had begun to worry that the Pamunkey were preparing another attack on Jamestown and that they were trying to get him to give them insider information to help with an attack. It's more likely that Opie Kanganu was trying to get confirmation that Smith was the leader of the English so that he could take him as a hostage for ransom. But fearing another attack, Smith was trying to figure out how he could warn his compatriots at Jamestown. So first he asked to go back to fetch some medicine for the dying boy, but they refused. Soon, Smith asked if he could send a message to his companions to tell them how well he was being treated to prevent their launching any reprisals. This request was accepted, and Smith wrote a note on a piece of paper, including a list of all the items that Opie Kanganu desired. The messengers returned from Jamestown with all the items requested, and Opie Kanganu was impressed with the detail of communication that could be expressed through the notebook's marks. He was also pleased with the confirmation of Smith's authority within the colony, and soon Smith was taken around to various Indian villages, eating, meeting their leaders, and seeing their dominions. At Tappahannock, residents wanted to make sure that he wasn't the person who had visited them a few years before and killed a bunch of people, including their king. But because Smith was quite short and the other guy had been fairly tall, they were happy to confirm his innocence in the matter. Smith's tour ended in Werowocomoco, the capital of the Powhatan Empire, where he became the first Englishman to meet the leader of the 37 Powhatan tribes, the father of Pocahontas, Wahun Seneca. Wahun Seneca was happy with Smith's conversations with his brother, and he had decided to meet him personally. Now, I'd be willing to bet that the conversations between Wahun Seneca and John Smith were some of the most interesting conversations in history. John Smith had lived a life full of adventure, and Wahoon Seneca had built one of the strongest empires in North America at the time. In their very different experiences, they both developed a very similar approach to relations between the two peoples. This means that in these conversations, the two were both going to try and figure out as much as possible about the other, while revealing as little as possible about themselves. Both saw an alliance with the other as a potential asset. Smith hoped to get food and learn about precious minerals or a route to the South Sea or the Pacific. And Wahoon Seneca wanted weapons that he could use both as insurance against the English and to solidify his power over his own dominion and defeat his enemies and expand his territory. Wahoon Seneca was in a war with neighboring Siouan and Iroquoian peoples, and some of his own tribes only paid tribute to his empire out of fear. So, Wahoon Seneca asked Smith why the English were in Sinakamoko. Smith told him that he and his father Newport were fleeing the Spanish, driven to these shores after a battle with their enemies. They had lodged, he said, to protect themselves while their ships were being repaired, and they would eventually return to England. Wahoon Seneca asked, if their stay was temporary, then why were they exploring so much? And to this, Smith was actually reasonably honest. He said the English wanted to find access to the South Sea, and they also wanted to avenge the slaying of one of Newport's children. Wahoon Seneca replied that he had heard of such a sea, and near to that sea, he had heard of a description of people similar to the English, who had stone houses and lots of brass. This was reference number two to the possible Roanoke settlers. Smith described England and Wahoon Seneca described his own dominion, and he even offered the English a better place to live near Werowocomoco, but Smith refused the offer. According to Smith, after their conversation, his head was put on a large stone and then raised their clubs to kill him when Pocahontas threw herself over him and saved him. After that, Wahoon Seneca was happy to let him live and to make metal items for him as tribute. Wahoon Seneca said that they were friends and that he should go to Jamestown and send him two great guns and a grindstone. This, of course, is the most iconic scene in Jamestown history. We don't fully know what happened there, though, or if it happened at all. 
We do know that Smith's interpretation wasn't the whole story, and a variety of other perspectives have arisen. Some Powhatan descendants say that the story doesn't fit their traditions, and they believe it didn't happen at all. This is possible, and Smith was known for spinning a good tale. Also likely is that it was a ceremony to show Smith's relationship to Wahoon Seneca. When his head was put on the rock and he was about to be killed, it showed Wahoon Seneca's strength over him. But when Pocahontas threw herself over him, she showed the fact that Smith would receive mercy. The Powhatan Indians often used children as a symbol of peace. Another interpretation is that it was a ceremonial killed and reborn ceremony. Inducting Smith and therefore all of the English, into Powhatan society. Details of the exact ceremony aside, the outcome was clear. Wahoon Seneca did make Smith the Werowance of the English and asked for English goods, including two cannons and a grindstone. He told Smith that he could come and go in safety, and he gave him two guides to take him back to the settlement. Back in Jamestown, life was still, well, same old, same old. Ratcliffe had appointed archer to the council in Smith's absence and against Martin's wishes. Food was scarce and the weather was cold. We now know that there was a mini ice age going on and back in London, even the Thames froze over. But the colonists had assumed that Virginia would have a similar climate to southern Spain, which shared its latitude. This assumption had been substantiated by the hot, hot summer, but it wasn't true in the winter and the colonists yet again found themselves struggling. They got Smith's note, which said that Opie Conganu had taken him prisoner and offered him land and women and life if he would reveal Jamestown's weaknesses. Smith's note said that this meant that a full-scale attack on the fort was being planned and that they should send the requested objects and fire a volley of shot to demonstrate the fort's strength. This united most of the residents in a sense of common purpose, but Ratcliffe, Archer, and a handful of others were considering taking the pinnace to England and leaving the rest of the colonists to their fate. As tensions heated up, Smith entered the fort, accompanied by two Indians. To the shock of the rest of the colony, he ordered the guards to bring two cannons and a millstone, and he instructed his guides to take them back to Powhatan. The cannons were both one and a half tons each, though, so this is obviously an impossible task. They tried to move them, but they couldn't, and Smith continued to reassure them that they could take them back, but eventually they gave up, and as they left, Smith loaded the cannons with rocks and fired them into the nearby trees, bringing ice, snow, and branches crashing down around them. He then gave them some other things to assure them of his good intentions, and because they hadn't been able to take the cannons that he had so honestly offered. It was quite an entrance. Most people were very happy to see Smith, and they hoped that he had brought an arrangement for food or gold of some sort. Archer and Ratcliffe took the opportunity to accuse Smith of treachery, though, saying that he was directly responsible for the deaths of the people who were under his command, when he was taken prisoner. They cited his offer of the cannons to the Indians as evidence that he was tempted by Wahoon Seneca's offer of power for guns, and after yet another trial, Ratcliffe found Smith guilty and sentenced him to hang the following day. Deus ex machina, though, this was the moment that Newport's ship sailed back into Jamestown. He'd brought food and settlers in a sense of relief that was so overwhelming that the settlers forgot their fights and their woes, let Smith go and celebrate it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd appreciate if you'd rate and subscribe to the show. And you can also visit my website at AmericanHistoryPodcast.net or connect with me on social media. 